we've been talking about our high five. We talked about worship God, love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. He is the one true priority in all things. We talked about having peace, but that's the two is fellowship. We have fellowship. We are close not only with God, but we love each other. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And I want to suggest that's a whole lot of love, right? So we're close. Number three, we talked about evangelism. Think of the three crosses. If you think of the three crosses and Christ at the center, on one side and on the other side, one knew what it was about and received. Today you shall be with me in paradise, right? The other one rejected, separated from God throughout all of eternity. That's a bad day. Long day, an eternal day. And then we're gonna, next Sunday we're going to talk about discipleship, the four quadrants of your heart. We want all of our heart to be yielded to him. All of our life, we want to be yielded to him. We want to grow up in Jesus. We want to grow up in Christ. That is what discipleship is about. By the way, just let me just give you a snippet. We are all to be discipled, and we are all to disciple. Everyone should be discipled. Everyone should be discipling someone. Don't leave that up to Mark and I. We'll do our job. Amen? We'll talk about that in a week, about three weeks, what the work of the church is. And then our fifth, we think of the fifth, the thumb up, service. Lend somebody a hand, all hands together. That's our high five. By the way, I'm going to keep reminding you, if you see somebody serving, catch their eye and give them a thumbs up. They'll know what you mean. You don't have to shout it from the rooftops. We, don't want, we want to serve unto the Lord. Amen? Because that's the one that we care what he thinks. Now, let me... Uh, uh, let, let me once again, tell you a little bit of how we're doing this. I'm going to take one Sunday, and we're going to talk about each one of those. I'm going to talk about, really, Sunday morning, I'm going to preach a message, a scriptural passage, and I'm going to stick to the scriptural passage because all of these five are in scripture. We can use them many times over. There are many places. This morning, I, I just prayed about it, and the Lord brought me to Acts 8. Uh, I love Philip. I love what he did going after leaving a rev a spiritual awakening, just how exciting it would be to go into a place and, and people just getting saved everywhere. And I mean, you would just run to that, but God took him from that. But praise God, he was willing to go. And not only did God took, take him from that, sent him to a place, desert place, dry place, hardly anybody there. But yet, in obedience to God, God had it all mapped out, God had it all planned out, the right person at the right place, at the right time to meet someone in need of the gospel. Uh, I did not bring this up in my sermon this morning, but um, Hudson Taylor, 1850s, left to go to China, the inland mission in China. One of the people there that he met and led to the Lord was a man I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm going to say Nye, N-Y-I, however you pronounce that. And he began to, he led him to the Lord. He began to talk to him about the things of the Lord, began to disciple him in the things of the Lord. And he said, the place that you're from, England, he said, how long have y'all had the good news of Christ? How long have you had the gospel? Hudson Taylor thought about it and said, for many, many, many centuries. Here's the words that he said. My dad Searched for spiritual things his whole life. What took you so long? And when I think about, praise God for our, our Gideons. Raise your hand. Come on, Gideons. Raise your hand. Come on, I know you're there. there it's like I have to pull teeth or something. Like, amen. Alvin, you're in the back. I got you. Amen. Broadus, do you know how many... How many uh, countries have the Gideon Bible now that the Gideons are sharing the word of God in? You have the gospel in 200 territories. Countries and territories. How many do not have it yet? Okay. I know that at one time, the last time I heard, there were 60-something people languages that had yet to have the Bible translated 
in their tongue. Amen. 84. Just remember the Great Commission. We're supposed to go into all the world, Acts 1-8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. And sometimes we feel limited by that because we're in a small place. We're here in this place. And I always tell everybody, well, just start here. Start with you here. If you really wanted, to, if we're going to talk about the subject of evangelism, and I, I am going to again tonight, in a, in a short, y'all know what I mean when I say short, amen? It's all relative, right? It's all relative. But in a short word, I mean, just understand, if you ask me my goal, my goal would be that every Christian, every church member Christian would share their faith with someone at least once a year. That's not a great big goal. But if you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, if you had a burden for souls and prayed for a divine encounter with a holy, with a holy God and, and reach out and grab hold of someone and to lovingly share so that they would have the opportunity, the opportunity, that's all we're asking for, is just giving someone the opportunity. You can't do it for them. But praise God, everyone needs to hear at least once. Would you agree? If you ask me my goal, it would be that we would seek to share the gospel every opportunity that we had. As I said this morning, it will not happen unless we do it intentionally. But if we could move towards that goal, but, but I understand, uh, I, I was speaking with someone and, and about my message, and I, I pray that I was not negative this morning. If, if I came off as such, I apologize. I did not seek to be negative in any way, shape, form, or fashion, but there are just some truths that are, that are what they are. And, and I don't know what it is about evangelism, but we're gonna, there are some things in the church we don't have to work at, we just do. And we do it pretty well. I mean, we're going to teach. We're going to worship. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. Praise God, we're going to give. We're going to sacrifice. But, but yet, if I, want to if I could tell you the one thing in the church that will always drift, always drift to inactivity, it's evangelism. Can I share a secret? That's true in my life. If I'm not intentional, I'm going to whisk my day away and get to the end of the day, and I'll think back. I'll, I can get my gratitude list, and I can thank the Lord for all the things that he's done for me, and then I think, but you never shared with anybody else. And it's, I want to have a gratitude list because I think God should be praised. And, and, and we need to recognize the things that we know that God has done for us. I think that's a wonderful way to, of saying to God, thank you. Praise your holy name. But I want us to be intentional. So I have two beliefs that I, I know that we all agree with tonight. But I want to state these and state the reasons why. Is that fair? All right, number one, this is my first belief. We, we believe that lost people... And by that I mean those who are without Christ. We believe that lost people matter to God and therefore should matter to the church. Amen? Luke 15 verse 7 says this. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Hundred, I preached on this last spring. Ninety-nine who are good. But if there's one that's lost, that's the one that Jesus is going after. The good shepherd goes after them, finds them, puts them up on his shoulders and carries them home. 
not leaving it on them to find their way home, carries them home, bears them home, comes home and, 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 and has a party. Rejoice with me. I promise you, that was good singing tonight, Brother Mark. Brought us normally on Wednesday night, I'll bring out the, the, the old red book and we'll sing out of that. We don't do that much on Sunday night. I, and I, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. But, but rejoice over the one soul who got saved. I promise you, those are good Sundays. Those are good worship services. Just do this for me. Think of the last person that you shared Christ with that got saved. Now tell me what your attitude was like 30, 45 minutes later. I've been doing it for a lot of years. I've been doing it for a whole lot of years, and I tell you, I still feel the same today as I did way back then. I don't think I touched the ground the first 45 minutes. I think I rejoice more than they do. I've led those to Christ who, didn't, who looked at me with a blank stare. Yes, Lord. And I'm like, well, amen. Not everybody's going to shout and sing and do cartwheels. That's all right. My dad was one of those in church. He never raised his hands. He sat on them. But that's all right. I don't have a problem with raising your hands. I don't have a problem with shouting. As long as it's for the glory of God. I don't have a problem with truth coming out within you. If you want to say yes, amen, right on, go Whatever your, your dialect is, I'm fine with that. But there's something that happens in our spirit when someone else is added to the family. When you go to the place in the hospital and a child has been born, nobody's sad. Everybody's happy. There is rejoicing in the kingdom of God when somebody walks out of darkness and enters into light. I mean, that's better than, than, than coffee and, and cake. Amen? What kind of cake? No! God help them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. <laughs> Matthew 18, verse 14 says this. Even so, it is not the will of your Father in heaven. Not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I believe that pretty, that's one of the many verses that kind of settles it. For God so loved the world. The plan of salvation is a whosoever will plan. I praise the Lord for that. He said, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to share something with you that you already know is a fact. Most people come to know the Lord between now. It used to be between 6 and 21. They're saying now most people come to know the Lord between 7 and 17. How many of you came to know the Lord between 7 and 17? How many of you became a Christian after the age of 30? We have one. I feel like an auctioneer. Do I see two? Do I see two? How many? Anybody other than one? Wow. Can I just say better late than never? Amen. Amen. I, I, I will tell you, I am very grateful that I did it at 10 years of age. I wished I'd done it at nine or at eight. I was, uh, well, I still am stubborn. And I knew better, and I struggled. But I tell you what, on the Saturday night before, Friday night before, the Holy Spirit was on me like you wouldn't believe. And I felt so alone and so far from God. My dad spoke to me on that Saturday morning because he knew, he knew what God was doing in my life. I must have had a billboard over my head, you know, the flashing neon. And my dad answered the simple questions that, I, that were the roadblocks, that were the roadblocks that Satan had put in the way. 
in a simple way, my father took all those roadblocks away. And on the next night, why I didn't do it the next Sunday morning, I don't know. But on Sunday night, in a time and a service kind of like this where there was a little bit of freedom, wasn't quite as stiff, I gave my heart and life to Christ. And I tell you, it's the greatest decision I ever made. I've never regretted it. I mean, I've had to struggle with it from time to time. Am I worthy of it? Did I do something that would take away my salvation? You know, all those things that, that Satan wants to bring in so that you lose the joy of your salvation. But Satan can't take away my salvation. So I just apply the truth of the Word of God. So here's the question that, that I have, and I'm not trying to be rude. Please hear my heart. If we think so highly of the gospel of Jesus Christ, why do we not talk about it more? Satan is very good at his job. Satan is very good at his job. He will get us so sidetracked on everything else that really doesn't matter that we don't spend time with that which really does matter. I believe that's collectively across the board. Amen. Well, I told you my first truth I wanted to share tonight. We believe that lost people matter to God and therefore should matter to the church. Number two, we believe the unchanging truths of the gospel should be shared in ways that are relevant to the needs of people's lives today. I'm going to say it again. We believe the unchanging truth of the gospel should be shared in ways that are relevant to the needs of people's lives today. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Now that first part, I usually say that was my introduction. That wasn't my introduction. I'm halfway through. You there say amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Verse number 19. Here Paul, speaking to the, the very Greek church, the very pagan culture that they came from, now Christ is in their heart. Now they're seeking to, um, to know God. All these other groups are coming in trying to confuse them. Some say I'm of Paul. Some say I'm of Apollos. Some say I'm of Jesus. They didn't really, they, they were just, Satan always attacks relationships. And he was attacking this church. So Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 9, For though I am free from all men, y'all say free? Amen. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom, liberty, set free. I've been freed from my guilt. I've been freed from my sin. Raised to walk in newness of life. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. That's an amazing statement. He said, Christ is set me free, but now I have come back and willingly made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. He said, literally, every person I meet, I put myself under. Instead of trying to impress everybody as if you are over, he said, I'm coming to the place where everybody that I meet I put myself under. I am literally slave, free slave, bond slave. Not that someone owes me. I am owned by God, but because God has set me free, I now have freely made myself a servant to others. He says that I may win the more. What does that mean? Verse 20. To the Jews I became a Jew that I might win Jews. To 
to those who are under the law, that is the Jews, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. <clears throat> to those who are without law, Gentiles, as without law, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the, to the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save, what's it say? Some. So if, 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 he is, if Paul is speaking to a Jew, he knows a little bit about that. So he's, he can share, he knows what they believe, he knows what they're thinking, he knows what their, their trust is in, and he talks to them about that. Can I say it this way? He speaks to them not only in a language, but in a way they can understand. He didn't put himself above. He didn't put himself as if he is uh, uh, less than them. He speaks to them at their level. What about those who are work salvation? There were plenty of of Jews that thought they were going to make it simply because they're Jews. And he understood that and shared with them in a way. What about those who are out there just trying to keep up with every little inf infinito thing of the law so because they thought their works were going to get them to heaven? Well, he had lived that too, and he understood that too. So he could come to them, and he could talk about their, forgive me for using this kind of a language, but he knew their junk, so he could share with them and their, about their junk. He had been caught up in that quicksand at one time as well. Hear this. If you did not know Christ, right, and you were just out there wondering, I could come to you with a work salvation and I can make it sound really good. As a matter of fact, you can take Jesus Christ and still preach works and make it sound right. But Ephesians 2 is still there. For by grace you save through faith. Yet not of yourself it is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. We, we'd want to boast about all the things that we do. You're only going to get there by what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. You're only going to get there by the grace of God. You didn't deserve it. You can't repay it. It's just a free gift given to you. All you did was for. Just ask him to forgive you of your sins and to receive that gift. A John 3, 16 gift. You just took what God so freely gave to you and you made it your own. But he could talk to those people about works. What about those people who have, they're just wide open, believing in anything and everything. And he said, look, you've got to understand where they're coming from. In this same book also, he had to talk to them about uh, eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. Now he said, hold up, I'm free. That meaning I bow to Christ, I don't worry about that, so if I can get some cheap meat because it's already been sacrificed to an idol, amen, I'll buy it. I won't let anybody know, I'll go home and I'll have me a good steak. Or, or maybe the former Jew would say, I'm going to have me a pork loin. <laughs> Barbecue. Y'all aren't with me tonight, I can tell. <clears throat> but he said, if someone is there and they're watching you and you can lose your witness by eating that, don't you do it. Don't you do it. But if you, even though you might have the liberty to do it, don't let the things in your life be a stumbling block. Matter of fact, if you go to someone's home and they don't know better and they put barbecue in front of you, enjoy. They are without the law. So when you meet with them, you be without the law, though your law is to Christ. I love this phrase. We know it very well. He says, to those that are weak, who would give in to these things or who frail, meet them in that way, that you might win the weak. He said, I have become all things to all men, that by, 
that I might by all means just save some. Some will reject, but whatever. Pastor, what are you trying to say? I'm afraid that our definition of what it means to witness is very tightly framed. Uh, every time I talk about evangelism, somebody wants to talk about knocking on doors. I've done all the knocking on doors. I've done that. I've walked from one place to the next. And, and <clears throat> the only people that I know knocking on doors today are the Jehovah Witnesses. By the way, they think that's the only way they're going to get to heaven. It's a works-based salvation. And, and I don't like the numbers game, the Jehovah Witnesses. I mean, 144,000 are going to make it, and you're praying for others to be bad so that you can be good enough to get in. Come on. I don't like that. We want as many. Amen? We want, we want as many as we can to get in. Praise God. Right? But, but listen, in our day and time, in, at least in America today, that's tough. How many of you don't like it when somebody rings your doorbell? It better be FedEx, <laughs> UPS, right? We don't like that anymore. But, but, but often people will say, hold on, hold on. If we're going to do evangelism, this is how we have to do it. Folks, there's a thousand ways to do it. There's all kinds of ways. And we want to use every means possible that we can... That save some I don't care how there's no bad way to share your faith if you're sharing it from a heart overflowing with the love of God just do it if we have a ladies event here and, and we just going to put up we'll just put it we'll do all the food for them and we'll make it look like pretty like the ladies because we'll have a ladies crew decorating it amen it won't be me in charge of that I promise you but if we had a ladies event and we cater the food and we and us men we serve them and 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 all the, they they have a little tea and with a finger up and all that kind of stuff well praise God amen and somebody preaches the simple message of the gospel and maybe somebody you invited that doesn't know Christ come to know Christ is that a bad way no no I, I like Larry Wynn down at Hebron Baptist he was the first one to do it as far as I know he did the wild game dinner, and all of us guys wanted to go eat buffalo and snake and gator. Now, I'm a Georgia fan. Now, there's not too much gator I like. Amen? But I ate some gator tail. And the Bible says, and it was good, right? I don't care. I don't care if we have to serve them elk or dove or quail. Is that a bad way to reach somebody with Christ? If we do a who's your one, so you pray over one person and you spend two weeks, two months, six months, whatever it is, building a relationship with someone so you can invite him to what we will call a harvest day and we'll, we'll pray and we'll do all these things and they come in and hear a sermon and maybe get saved, is that a bad way? What if we get out of track? The tracks still work. If it's still got the Word of God in it, it's a track that'll still work. And y'all ladies have these suitcases that you carry around with you called pocketbooks, and you can put hundreds in there. My wife carries every coupon for every fast food restaurant in town in hers. Am I telling the truth? Oh. Oh, they're in her console. That's what she said. Amen. All I know, well, see, that tells you one thing. I don't look in her pocketbook anymore. I know better. That's exactly right. She'll say, get this out of my pocketbook, and I'll take it to her and say, you get it out of your pocketbook. <clears throat> look, I don't care if it's a group of men meeting on Thursday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning studying the Bible. Amen? I don't care if it's walking through the neighborhoods, giving out brochures for vacation Bible school. I did... Let me give you one caveat of that. I figured out last summer when we were going around that it's probably not a good idea for a man my age to be going through a park where the kids are playing, handing out flyers. If it was my granddaughter, I want to know who that guy was too. So I'm, ha I'm having to learn. Y'all hear me? What I've done before may not work today. 
But the deal is, is that they need to know Christ. They need to know Christ. I've been coming up with a, something I've been, it's been brewing in my mind. By the way, I'm videotaping now. We're doing these things for the, the high five. And uh, I told Mark, as soon as I get done with that, I'm, I'm going to videotape the gospel message and we're going to put it on the website. Matter of fact, we may put more than one gospel message on the website. So that if you know someone who needs to know Christ, you can just text them uh, our little point, you know, newhollandbc.org uh, slash, and where they can just hit that thing and go straight to it. And they can have someone share the gospel with them. You may want to have someone go out to eat and invite them to, a, to IHOP or wherever you hop, right? And, and go down and sit there with them and say, here's my phone. Would you take five minutes and look at this? That was Christ. My phone, it's right here. Man, that was on cue, wasn't it? We didn't work that out ahead of time, I promise. Hey, Brother Mark. By the way, were you saying this morning people need the Lord? I want that for a ringtone. <laughs> Steve Green singing people need the Lord. I want that for a ringtone. That'd be great. Wouldn't it be wonderful every time the phone rang and you, you go, I don't want to have to answer it. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. Yeah. That's a rabbit I don't need to chase. Where was I? What if you invited someone to the IHOP and you sat down and say, can, can I share with you, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? Would you watch five minutes of our pastor explain it to them and then answer a question where you don't even have to share the gospel with them? I don't care how we do it. I want to do it in a hundred different ways. You see, the, the way that it would affect me may not be the way that it would affect Cheryl, may not be the way that it would affect Jim. And we all are different, and we need to, by all means, save some. So if I'm talking to someone, I, I, the person I was going to go talk to yesterday was Steve's brother. And, and I, I'm going to do my best, and I don't care if they, they send him home from the hospital today. I'm going to find him. And I'm praying about this, and you pray about it too. Because I want to have a conversation with him where he does not feel offended. I want to have a conversation with him that I can move it to the gospel. That I, I, Whatever I have to do, if I have to make him laugh, if I, have to, if I cry in front of him, I don't care what I have to do. If he'll just give me a short snippet of time where I can give him an opportunity to come in front of the life-changing good news of the Calvary. And I think if you share it in your heart, if it means something to you, they'll know that it means something. It'll mean something to them. If it means something to you. Can I just... Gosh, my time is gone. I told you about that short part, didn't I? Don't turn there. Let me just read this and I'm going to close. The greatest church planner in the history of the church was the Apostle Paul. He lived the gospel. He was a Jew that got saved. Romans chapter 9. I want you to hear his words. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Now he, his theology was good enough to know that that was not possible. He couldn't give up his salvation so that someone else could receive it. But he said, but if I could, I would. In the next chapter, in the first verse, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. They stoned him. They followed him from town to town against him. His first missionary trip, his second missionary trip. I mean, after his third missionary trip, he did an honorable thing to go back to Jerusalem. And he, he, he made a covenant. He shaved himself. He wanted to keep his vow unto the Lord. He was in the temple. He was going to, 
to, sacri- to, to praise God, to worship God. They found him, tried to kill him then, planned to kill him later. To this group of people, doesn't it sound like Jesus? To this group of people, he said, I would do anything for them to receive Christ. All I'm saying is, that's a pretty good attitude to have. And I know in my heart, I am praying that God would flame the fires of the burden. If we're not sharing out of the overflow of our love, if we're not sharing the good news of what, you know, we're, we're so, we, we love to talk about what's close to our heart. It may be cars, old cars, new cars, baseball, football, soccer, tiddlywinks. I mean, we're going to talk about what's passionate to us, this recipe, that recipe, this grandchild, that grandchild. If we can, we're going to talk about what's close to our heart. My prayer is that the, the flame of the Holy Spirit would just blow into our hearts. Because this, this is my Sunday night group. I don't know how many are here tonight, but I can tell you, the vast majority are so in love with Christ. And yet, you probably have the same testimony. I don't share the good news of Christ as much as I want to, as I should, and I'm burdened about it. I don't pray that that burden is lessened. I pray that that burden grows. We're on mission, folks. We're not done. God's not through with us. Will it be hard? Everything worthwhile usually is. Will you have to pay a price? If it's a value, so what? I haven't read in the paper very often in Gainesville where someone's been stoned or killed or shot because they shared in love the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's just start here. Who's your neighbor? Who's your one? Who are you working with? Who have you went? Who, when you talk to them, your soul grieves? Because of the overflow of the poverty in their soul. Let's just put a smile on his face. Let me pray. More about Jesus would I know. My prayer, O Lord, is more of Jesus that I would share. Father, thank you for Bible study. May we do Bible doing. Father, instead of learning more, let's practice what we already know and believe. Now, Lord, I know Satan's going to try to steal this, this seed of the Word in our heart, from our heart. He's going to come up with every excuse. Lord, I just pray that we hear from you. And Lord, we need your help, desperately need your help. We need your strength. All is vain unless the power of the Holy Spirit comes down. Father, but give us the willing desire to share. Give us the opportunity. And then give us the boldness to go forward. Bless these, your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.